What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Phil Gibson, a.k.a. Mr. Sue, is a Bitcoin musician, podcaster, content creator, and hodler. You can catch him on his Bitcoin podcast, A Boy Named Sue, where he says the quiet parts out loud, which is uh, released on Bitcoin Made Simple Podcast Network and his music video, ETF. Phil has several has written several notable pieces, including Economic Earworms of the Sound Money Revolution, published in Citadel 21, Volume 6, which we discussed in depth in Episode 57, The Sound Money Music Revolution and the Fed and Economic Earworms. He's also written Why Jerome Powell's Policies Are Bullish for Bitcoin, published in Bitcoin Magazine recently. And that is largely the basis of this episode, running it back with Mr. Sue. Phil Gibson, welcome back to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. How are you? Said I'm great. Thanks again for having me. I'm very excited to get into this. Yeah, man. It's been a while. I think it's coming up on a year since we saw last saw each other in person uh, yeah. down in <laughs> Dallas. Yeah, Big Flop Boom. Are you are you going uh, I, in Austin? I am going back. Cool. So now I'll get to I'm see. not going to be there. I cheaped out and didn't buy a uh, ticket. However, I will be in the vicinity as this happens. So. It's an interesting way to play it. Uh, I've, I've talked to other people who are very interested in playing it that way as well. <laughs> uh, it's not a bad idea. Uh, the conference itself is fantastic. I do recommend people go, but you know, if you're in Austin, yeah, there'll be opportunities to socialize. So I hope to see you there. Uh, it's a fantastic conference. Um, I'm super excited to reconnect. I, we, we talked a lot at the Bitcoin brunch, uh, at Bitbox boom the yeah. morning uh, after it all wrapped up. And so, uh, and I think for about, I think you, we got, we well, published this in what, January? So January, yeah. uh, we've been looking to talk about this for close to six, seven months now. Uh, but then you released a tweet thread, uh, what, a week or two ago? Uh, less than a week ago. Less than a week ago. And you hit me up with that. And that kind of connected a lot of dots. Uh, and then I went back and uh, in, in your article, you do reference uh, a conversation that you had with Tom Luongo on your show in October, 2021. I, I do recommend people check that out as well. Please. Um, so I, I'm super excited to get into this. There's a lot of material to cover. Um, so with, with the Federal Reserve being a lender of last resort versus like in Bitcoin land, uh, a buyer of last resort, that leaves them with, uh, I guess, several tricks up their sleeve. Um, what, I, I, what I'm kind of curious about, I want to read this to you from, from your article. Yeah. The Fed is ultimately beholden to its cartel of shareholders or member banks. This distributive system of banking and investment is what mandates the world's monetary policy. The primary dealers, and you list a lot of the banks, are important because they buy all the excess supply of U.S. Treasury paper reserves that's auctioned off by the Treasury Department in order to fund operations and keep the economy going. These primary members scoop up 50% of the issued treasuries and immediately sell them to the Fed in exchange for cash. I kind of, what, what does this even mean? I mean, they're buying something and then selling it right yeah. back. And, yeah, and so so this is kind of like debunking that like the Fed prints money. So the way that like money is actually created is that um, the Fed basically comes up with like a treasury, right? Like a bond. That's all that is, it, it's a bond. And then the treasury department issues that treasury to the market and they'll, they really issue it to um, the, the primary member banks. And so the member banks um, are like, you know, your JP Morgan, um, your, your Wells Fargo, Citibank, all of them are kind of shareholders of like the, the big commercial banks are the shareholders of the uh, Federal Reserve, like regional banks. And then the Federal Reserve regional banks are shareholders of the Fed itself. So like they are kind of like all the banks are the board members of the Federal Reserve, but that aside, so the treasuries are issued to 50% of the, treasuries are issued to the banks, right? Because the treasuries are sources of collateral that they have. And, and then who gets to sp scoop them up? Um, the rest of the 50% are, um, well, I think I mentioned it in there. Yeah, 30% go to uh, foreign, foreign central banks. Yeah. 
and 20% is left to the private sector. What, what just kind of gets me about this, though, is it seems very circular uh, yeah, between the yeah. primary banks and, and the Fed. Yes, definitely. Um, well, it's circular because that's why the Federal Reserve was created in the first place. So where does the Fed get all the money to bail out everybody, like the, the banks? So the way that the money printing happens is that the banks hold a treasury as collateral. When they need cash, and we'll get into like the difference of repo and reverse repo, but when they need cash, this is how, well, before I get into that. So when we talk about like monetizing the debt, that that's what the whole treasury auction thing is, right? So um, the, the money that the uh, treasury department, I guess, gets when the banks buy those treasuries, that is what kind of, I would imagine goes out into the economy for uh, stimulus stuff. And then when uh, there, there's, you know, a big trouble in, in little China, when there's a, when more stimulus needs to happen, the, the banks that have the, that collateral, those treasuries, they basically send those to the Fed in exchange, they get cash. That's what a repo is. So bank, I, I'm a bank, I have a treasury, that's collateral. That treasury leaves me, I need cash. And that goes, that treasury gets sat in an account at the Fed. And, um, and then the Fed gives me money. And right. then I have that money. And then I fractional reserve against it. So I give out loans against that extra money that I have. Right. Uh, it's just fascinating because you got the treasury from the Fed in the first place. It's just really uh, a fascinating uh, relationship there. So talking about these tools a little bit, like what did Bernanke do in 2008 that kind of changed yeah. the game here? Yeah. So Ben Bernanke, after he basically let's call it money printing. After he printed a bunch of this money that was just out there, you might wonder as Bitcoiners, you know, money printing go burr, why isn't there hyperinflation like Weimar Republic? Well, Bernanke had to fight back against the inflation that he created. Mm -hmm. And so to fight back against that, he, he basically created um, latent, latent inflation. He sterilized it by using what was called I-O-E-R, I-O-E-R, and that stands for interest on excess reserves. So excess cash reserves that the bank has, they are then incentivized to not hold on to that cash because remember, unlike uh, any debt that you have, that's a liability on you, but the debt is actually an asset to the bank and any cash that they have is a liability to them because they'd rather turn that cash into a loan and gain interest payments from the loan in, in, in interest. That's how banks make their money. So um, when banks have all this excess cash after you know a, a panic and stimulus, they have all this like excess cash that they were fractional reserve lending against. That's a liability. It's sitting there. It's just sitting there. It's not getting anything. It's not, it hasn't been turned into a, a loan and they're not getting interest on it. So what, what are they going to do? They're not just going to have it like sit there and like hyperinflate. So they move the excess reserves, the cash reserves, into an account with the Fed, and it gains interest. And in Bernanke's case, what did I say? Was it 25 basis points? Uh, yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So 25 basis points. He raised points. it, yep. Yeah. And that's crucial because there was nowhere else <laughs> out in like the market economy where you could gain that much interest. And so <laughs> like it, it's kind of like government distorting like competition and destroying competition. So people took their excess reserves and they send it over to an account at the Fed and it just gained interest, you know, like a block fi. Right. <laughs> so that's that's basically what Bernanke did. He prevented the hyperinflation by sterilizing that inflation. Right. And that brought in, I think you uh, state 2.8 trillion got parked at the Fed after that. Was it after, was it Bernanke or is that when we get into the reverse repo? Because there is a uh, difference. I don't know if you're ready to get into the reverse. Uh, I think that's next. But naturally, banks responded and enrolled with the new policy and parked 2.8 trillion at the Fed to earn a quarter point interest. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's been a while since I ran it. Yeah, no, it's crazy. Uh, but what is uh, then repo? Yeah. So I explained what repo is. It's basically just that same relationship. Banks hold on to collateral and uh, the Fed repos, repurchases that on a temporary basis and they're short contracts. 
I like to call AI, as I put out in the in the article, it's high time preference QE, because what Ben Bernanke did was quantitative easing. And it was that relationship with going to take your treasuries and here's some cash. So that was quantitative easing. Repos high time preference quantitative easing because the repo contracts are like on average like two weeks long in duration, but uh, I mean they uh, colloquially call it overnight repo. So it really depends on the the duration of like what the contract is. Sorry, I fucked up my camera here. No, okay. um, so it all like varies depending on the bank and you know what they uh, agreed with with the with the Fed or the 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 repo facility. So you have um, you have reverse repo, which, I mean, that was like the, the repo spasm, I think, because uh, the Fed stopped lending out um, cash reserves to foreign banks because they, the Fed stopped taking foreign collateral, like Euro, um, like German, German bonds, all these other like bonds, these debt instruments from uh, Europe. And uh, I guess we can get into like the euro dollar like later and uh, what I talked about in the thread, but I'm trying to keep it concise step by step, not jump the gun too much. Um, so the, the repo spasm that we saw in 2019 was basically like those markets, those fast overnight markets. Uh, um, but basically the high time preference QE, it's, it was kind of like the same thing that happened in 08 when all these banks were lending it to each other and they didn't actually have the money to like pay back at the end of the day. And so the Fed had to like come in and, you know, uh, bail out the, I think, um, like private equity firms as well, which mm. had never happened in history. And so that kind of brings us to, um, to what reverse repo is. And this is what Powell did. So it was just the same thing, but he, well, what do I say in the article? He moved how many billions overnight? With the reverse repo? Yeah. Uh, oh. Uh, Four hundred to seven hundred billion or something. Not sure offhand. Uh, are you talking about on December 20th, 20, 20, yeah. twenty twenty one? Yes. It was one point seven trillion flowed into the Fed's repo facility. Yes. Yes. He said, "Make it the highest one day cash injection to date." Yeah. So uh, basically, I mean, Powell did the same thing that Bernanke did, but it was only uh, five basis points instead of twenty five. But now I think it's like 30 or 60 or something crazy. And th the important thing is that the Federal Reserve is off the reservation because in 08, the Federal Reserve was the bank that bailed out the world. And ever since, I mean, the Fed's lost credibility by printing all this money. And Powell, I guess, deep down is actually a fiscal conservative. And his incentive is to protect the banks because when you print all this money and you have countries like China and others just selling off treasuries. That selling off of treasuries means that we don't trust the United States and they're not credible. So Powell wants to reverse that because if the Federal Reserve goes down, the, the banking industry goes down. And so he needs to reverse that by incentivizing people that have excess cash to move that into an account at the Fed and earn interest higher than anywhere else in the, that the, the market offers in, in the money markets. So Powell is basically removing dollar liquidity out of the, the global system to assert the Federal Reserve's independence from the rest of the world, or really Davos, Europe. And he's doing this to essentially destroy the European and the world economy. You might think that they're raising rates. So, I mean, he's using the reverse repo facilities and raising rates, but he's doing that to essentially have his version of the Great Reset, not this Klaus Schwab Great Reset where you're, you'll own nothing to be happy. He basically wants to destroy those people. And so everybody's um, basically dependent on the United States economy. And that's where they're gonna park their money after Europe falls, capital flight, it's ultimately comes down to battle of capital flight. Capital flees Europe because Arguably, Europe is trying to intentionally destroy their economy and build back better with green energy solutions, which is just a, a bullshit excuse that they're using to basically have all the oil and you know kill off their population. As crazy as that sounds, but it's it's true. I mean, there's something called the, the golden one million of the ruling class that rules over the golden billion, and a billion is like the cap of like the population that they basically want to 
see live on this earth. This is this this Klaus Schwabian, Davos, WEF, old European money, oligarchs, Anglophile, eugenicists. Like this sounds crazy, but that is basically what the Federal Reserve is up against. And the Fed's been against this really arguably for a while, I would say, since Powell tried to raise rates in 2018. But I don't remember what conference it was, but it was last year where Christine Lagarde and all these other central bankers were meeting at Davos and saying that their agenda, their monetary agenda needs to be focused towards climate change. And Powell was just like, uh, no, we just care about us and the Fed and the banks. And we want to keep our system as it is. We're done bailing your asses out. And we're not aligned with this green digital panopticon that you commies are essentially trying to force down and throw. And I and Tom Longo are amongst the, uh, the minds that think that COVID-19 was a straight up attack on the Fed. To, f- to force the Fed to stimulate, to financially stimulate itself into oblivion, ruin its credibility, have capital flight, leave the United States, go back into Europe, because Europe essentially wants to take back the, their colonies. And, and basically do a reverse Bretton Woods to where the monetary transmission mechanism, the, the power, the economic powerhouse isn't stemming from the United States, it's back into Europe. And arguably you could say, you know, China is heavily involved too. And there's a whole other rivaling force with uh, Russia and, and BRICS. So BRICS stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And now arguably Israel, uh, you know, put a, put a pin in that. We, we still need to see what's going to come out from that. May or may not happen. But you're, you're essentially seeing this global bifurcation of the monetary system. And not just that culturally, politically, but as, as history shows, any nation that wants to be self-sovereign is going against this new world order global communist cabal, which arguably today is manifested as Davos. And so Powell is saying no to that and is fighting back against that. You might think that, oh, well, the Fed's going to have a CBDC. No, they're not. They're not. And I laid this out in, in, the, art, in, the, in the thread that I wrote. But a central bank digital currency strips out cash rates, the global financial system in the US. It, it takes out the Federal Reserve system. Because again, who are the shareholders of the Federal Reserve? The banks. You have a central bank digital currency issued by the Federal Reserve, then you render the banks useless. And sure, are they gonna have like some sort of like like, like stable coin issued by the, the banks? And it's gonna be like CBDC like? Sure, but ultimately what Davos wants is a central bank digital currency issued by the IMF into your digital wallet. And sure, maybe the, the Federal Reserve and other central banks issue it, but they still take like dick, dick top from the IMF. So that's essentially what Davos wants. Like Davos is the World Economic Forum, all of that European old money commie agenda. The way they take back control is to take back control of the money printer, the ultimate money printer. And the United States economy, the Federal Reserve stands in its way. So that's all Powell is acting in. He's not an Austrian economist. And even though that I say Powell is my pal on my Twitter, that is a troll. But honestly, I, I, I grow more sympathetic towards the dude. And hearing people like Daniel D. Martina Booth talk about it, and when she was on the on the the pro pal, uh, you know, pal club train when he first got inaugurated. At the, at the end of the day, like they call him private equity pal for a reason, but he's he's a capitalist, and everything that this European uh, just squad, this ilk, wants is completely antithetical to American capitalism as we understand it. And it's not perfect. I think it's crony capitalism as well. But as I say in that that Twitter thread, I'd rather go down with the Federal Reserve on top 
then a central bank digital currency issued by Klaus Schwab and his banana hammock. And the Federal Reserve is, whether or not it's just an academic paper that created some government job for some smart kid at MIT to write, uh, maybe it's just like smoke and mirrors, but the Federal Reserve of, of Cleveland, and I think, I can't recall uh, what the other one, oh, St. Louis, they both came out in the past couple of weeks with papers talking about Bitcoin and how Lightning Network is energy efficient or Bitcoin doesn't leave a big carbon footprint and how Lightning Network is how you like do money. <laughs> so they're actually writing papers legitimizing Bitcoin. And just today, like 16 hours or so ago, there was a, um, a, a, re a release of uh, some developers uh, writing about Fetty Mints and basically making a uh, private like Chamian digital cash mints a thing. Basically you're, you're, you're able to issue like a credit IOU uh, in this kind of like block stream federation model as uh, Bitcoin being the reserve asset, but you can basically issue like notes on top of it. And all these things are just coming to light at the same time. And it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's remarkable. I'm kind of going off on a tangent and I probably kind of went out of order of how you want to want to, you know, execute this. But um, like long story short, Pal is deep, is fighting back against globalism. And it's just in, in his incentive and Jamie Dimon's and the Federal Reserve of New York, the, the New York Fed's most powerful. Uh, that's, where, that's where monetary policy happens in New York. And the New York Federal Reserve is basically the, the diktat of that monetary policy. It's basically Pal fighting to preserve the interest of American capitalism as we know it, fighting back against Davos, which represents global communism, New World Order. Wow, uh, I loved it. Uh, feel free to do it anytime again. Uh, I wrote down like 50 words. I want to kind of, I mean, there's a lot of yeah. angles here. Uh, yeah. what, what I really got from that was this new wrinkle on all of this around uh, Davos. So I kind of thought that uh, either Davos and the West, and when I say that, I mean the United States and the Federal Reserve were, were completely aligned. Yeah. But now I see where maybe they just had mutual uh, aligned interests for a while, and then some of those interests have diverged. Um, I never, and, and I, I thought maybe when we talk about sort of globalists and, and that kind of thing, I thought that maybe China, Davos, and the Fed were aligned. And now I kind of see how there's a more competing interests and yeah. it, it kind of explains a lot to me that I didn't see without understanding this. Yeah, I will, I mean, well, just take office politics, right? I mean, take like, I, I've been making the joke, like everybody gets along in the mafia until someone steps on someone else's salami, right? Okay. So it's all about, it, it's a power grab. All these people are just power hungry. And they are following their incentives, like to their core, like their, their roots. And when that gets tampered with, then they're going to fight to, to, to the death to maintain their power and order. Like, let's take, so Davos and the World Economic Forum, the Great Reset, they essentially want to undo the idea of nation states and have corporations replace nation states. <laughs> and when the CARES Act was passed, that basically, as I talk about in the article, that allowed non-financial entities, like anyone that's not a bank essentially, same access to the Fed window to buy all those treasuries. And so you have an entity like BlackRock, basically with the blessing of Klaus Schwab and the Great Reset World Economic Forum types, allowing through the CARES Act, non-banks, same access to the Fed window to buy treasuries. And so you wonder, oh, well, why is it that PAL is incentivizing people that if they use that Fed window access to trade that treasury in for cash, why is it that he wants to send all that extra cash into a reverse repo account? Because if you keep giving people free money, you lose credibility as a country monetarily and fiscally. 
And that is one way that Davos used finance to undercut the power of the Federal Reserve and the banks. Because if you give a non if you give a non-bank entity like BlackRock the same privilege that banks get, then you know how useful is that bank? It undercuts their power. And so that's why Powell, one of the reasons why Powell wanted to drain out all this money and basically margin call the European Union and <clears throat> prevent them from, uh, oh, I guess we can get into the SOFA reverse light board here, uh, but basically prevent them from having all this, this extra money to, uh, to, um, to, to undercut the, what the, the global, the, what the United States banking cartel has, if that makes sense. Yeah, and yeah, I, for me, the jury's still out. I mean, I don't know anything about Powell. Uh, I'm learning as we go here. Uh, I, I think he was also a lawyer. Yeah, he, um, he used to be a lawyer. He he was in the private equity uh, you know, field for I think a, a couple of decades. And just from reading his Wikipedia, he was he knows how to play the, the political line. I mean, Obama gave him high praise, and he was basically a friend of, of both sides of the aisle. But again, this goes back into like the bifurcation of powers. Obama is 100% Davos. And, so so um, that brings up, you know, the CARES Act, which uh, was passed by the U.S. government, yeah. not Davos, but, you know. So well, no, Congress is Davos. Like that's the what, okay, that's, so, so tell me more. I mean, to be honest, I don't know the full extent, and it would it'd just be so excruciating to, like, analyze each one of these political figures. But right. at the end of the day, it's kind of, like, undoing America and just these principles of like Marxism and, and communism. And honestly, if you look at the Democratic Party, whether it's the radical left like AOC or if it's like a Nancy Pelosi, either way, and they have infighting amongst them, each other, I'm sure, but this whole like Obama, O'Biden kind of thing, you can tell that they're working for Davos. Because Davos's goal is to have capital flight leave America as America's economy crumbles. Sorry, I keep fucking with my camera here. That's oh, annoying. Are, are they I, useful idiots or are they sort of align? Partially, partially. Yeah, I mean, you they probably, um, a, like Biden was probably selected because they knew that he was senile. And so uh, you have, Davos is trying to embarrass America politically, economically, socially, um, economically by trying to force the Fed to do all this COVID stimulus. Um, uh, culturally, by passing far leftist radical things like critical race theory, transgender rights, um, starting like race riots during summer 2020, and also uh, geopolitically or foreign, on a foreign policy basis, by pulling out of Afghanistan in the clumsily way that, that we did. And when you do all these things and you have, you appoint Davos sleeper cells on the left and arguably on the right, because like the right wing neocons like Mike Pompeo are Davos adjacent. They're from the Anglo sphere, which comprises of AUKUS. So um, AUKUS stands for Australia, UK, and uh, United States. That that's kind of like the neoconservative uh, kind of warmongering faction that you think of. Um, so there's that Anglosphere side of Davos, and then there's like old Europe side of Davos, uh, which is, you know, basically all ran dictated out of the, out of Germany, which is the economic backbone of Europe, because that's where the European Central Bank is located, headed by Christine Lagarde right now. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, so... Davos's goal is basically to make America embarrass itself to the point where all capital flight leaves there. Because if you don't, if you lose credibility as a nation, you lose credibility. Like you don't want to park your money there, and it's not a safe place to invest. So, as Davos is trying to destroy both its economy and America's economy, it basically it's a race to the bottom to where they want America's economy to die first. Have all have all that money leave America and go to Europe and um, and just have like a, an extra fallback basically. So Europe can like thrive 
and get away with passing like green renewable energy or whatever bullshit. It, it's basically a plot to destroy America. Yeah. And, and it's very interesting that I, I thought, you know, the yeah, that, that you, I mean, I don't know if Powell is really on the, the plight to save capitalism in America as much as to save the, his primary members. Yeah. But uh, I mean, that is capitalism as we know it. And honestly, I think I, I'm, I'm starting to give Powell too much uh, credit here, but uh, I mean, you did have a song called end the fed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's a complete 180, but that's why I'm just so annoyed how Bitcoiners are so driven to understand Austrian economics and the history of money. And you go, if you, all these other things. And so how can you be so invested in all that, but not kind of zoom out, look at the bigger picture. And that's, and that's why I, I love There's so many about. moving pieces here. Yeah. So I, many but, interest, in, intricacies. Yeah. So many. It's, it's not as simple as money printer go burr. We need hyperinflation for no, Bitcoin to succeed. Yeah. It's not that. Like all of this fucking bullshit moon juice that you hear from like Bitcoin maxis is retarded. It really is. And it's not helpful. And so if you want to be a part of the conversation, put a little bit of work into it and learn the nuances of geopolitics. And that's why I admire so much what Tom Luongo does. And it nuance is key and if you want to have an opinion and talk about what's going on put some of that work in otherwise you're just as bitter as peter schiff and the gold bugs where they're like oh everything's fucked we're gonna wait until we have all of our piles of gold in our backyard and everything's gonna be great i mean that's the same argument as bitcoin fixes this we're just gonna sit on our hands and wait and I know that's not happening because you have developers working on things and everything, and it's going to happen soon or later. I'm talking about like the just the, the loud like LARPers on Bitcoin Twitter, you know? Yeah. I hear you. Um, this is uh, so I'm, I'm mind blown a bit. So I'm really enjoying this. Uh, let's turn to your thread and, and that, that Zero Hedge article. Uh, which is Democrats demand 600 billion, 650 billion in IMF aid for Ukraine war relief in the form of SDRs. And you wrote, this is what Davos wants. Why does Davos want this? Because it's uh, essentially those SDRs that are uh, basically American funds that they, that every nation contributes a portion of their, uh, their money, their like, I guess, GDP whatever, to the IMF, which arguably is the World Bank. I mean, like the, 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 the true lender of only resorts now for the world instead of the Fed. It was the Fed, but the Fed, again, wants to preserve its credibility and its author reservation. And so the IMF is basically replacing that. And the IMF is basically finding a way, a roundabout way to make the Federal Reserve the lender of only resorts through taking the SDRs out of the IMF. Because, I mean, the Fed is in a roundabout way still doing that because the majority of SDRs, the, the major contributor of that is obviously America, right? I think they make up right. like 40% of SDRs. I can't remember what the number is, but it's the vast majority in comparison to the rest of the G7 nations or whoever the fuck else uh, contributes. I think it's like the G20, I'm not sure. But um they uh, essentially want to have that $650 billion so the, they can bail out the European Central Bank because Europe is bankrupt, okay? They don't have this money, this magic money printer that the Fed does because they don't have the world reserve currency and they don't have the uh, legitimacy and pristine collateral in U.S. treasuries that the United States has. What they have is that they basically have like a bucket of water and at the ECB, they have a big bucket of water, and then they have all these little buckets of the other um, central banks of, of uh, Europe. So like one in Italy, uh, just ev everywhere else. And so they could basically, like, like we saw in, in Greece, uh, Christine Lagarde had to sell German bonds to bail out Greece. 
So they basically just have a fixed amount of water, funnily, almost kind of like Bitcoin. They have a fixed amount of water where they are just like filling and, and emptying and trying to keep themselves afloat. While at the same time, they have to buy back uh, bonds and have yield control, a uh, yield curve control. And so how helpful would it be to have an extra 60, $650 billion from America and have America in this roundabout way bail out Europe again? And again, that's just another way that they, uh, that Europe survives and hopefully their policies that they try to pass to continually bear, embarrass America, uh, that that's just, an, that's just a, a bonus uh, check to keep uh, Europe afloat as America goes down. But America's not going down, obviously. The dollar index is strong. We had Euro, the Euro dollar parity actually, um, the, the, the euro was below the dollar for once. So you have you have Europe collapsing for it, it, its size. And Davos is basically, without pulling the nuclear option, trying to bail itself out any way that it can. And it's, it's kind of like, you, God damn it, this fucking laptop. Uh, you basically have a, you know, they, they put baby in, in the corner and a uh, baby's panicking. And so they're having to do all these, uh, these options. And, uh, and, and it kind of gets beyond that. Whereas you know, the, the sanctions on Russia have failed. The rubles gotten stronger. Russia basically is a huge part of this monetary bifurcation in the world. Um, they arguably force the world on a gold standard if they want oil or any other commodities from Russia because Russia sits on the world's natural resources or a good fraction of them. And the only way that you get oil is either, you know, pay us gold or you pay us rubles. And that's why the ruble has such a drastic re recovery uh, after uh, Russia invaded Ukraine because, you know, where are you going to go to get this oil that uh, if you're Europe, you're trying to cut off uh, oil reserves, um, which funnily enough, Russia, I think has finally cut off uh, its bigot to uh, Germany because it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's had enough. And basically as we've seen in history, any nation that wants sovereignty in any way, shape or form, again, goes against this global, global hegemony that uh, people at Davos want. And a lot of this, I think, stems in racism, too. I need to look further into this, but russophobia is a thing amongst, like, Devotian Europeans and... What's that? What's the word? You... What oh, phobia? Oh, russophobia, Russia. Like, it's just, like, a... Uh, in, uh, like... Uh, so they're inherent... racist against Russians. Yeah, an inherent racism against Russia for, I think, centuries, and, and Asia as well. And there are some Europeans that believe that Russians are actually like sleeper cell Asians. So like racism plays into it. And it's basically just, you know, white Europe wanting to uh, colonize and have people abide under their communism. That's what it boils down to. And anyone that wants to go off on their own is a threat to them. From what I gathered from your thread, uh... One of the reasons Congress wants to go through the IMF is they have a little bit more better governance there to release the funds. Yeah. Where they can't really do it through uh, sort of the administrative process here and the, and the three yeah. branches. Do you want to just go by like a thread by thread, maybe to make concise a little bit, make it easier for you to follow along? Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, my, my, my next question though was uh, does Davos want uh, this war in Ukraine? Um, they, they, they did, but Ukraine is losing terribly. And so they're going to probably focus the attention towards a war in China instead, frankly. Okay. So you need to economically bankrupt America, right? I mean, that's how great world resets happen after, is after war, right? So that's what they're working towards next. And there was a, a three lighthouse speech that Mike Pompeo recently gave basically, uh, champion this 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 rhetoric and okay and uh 
Where does China fall into all this? We talked a lot about, or a little bit about Russia. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, uh, where, is China aligned with Davos? Are they aligned with the US? Are they aligned they with They were, Russia? but China wants their own like commie panopticon kind of thing. And they're probably, um, I haven't followed too much of like the macro as far as China goes, but I, I do know that they are trying to do their own regional empire thing by their Belt and Road Initiative. But essentially, they're a paper tiger monetarily. And so they're trying to export all their inflation by replacing the IMF and being able to give out these loans or infrastructure to these uh, smaller nations like the Kingdom of, of Tonga, as, as Lord uh, Fusatua talks about. And I had him on my show. There was like a two-part interview that we did. But that's essentially like what, um, what China's doing. They're exporting their inflation through the Belt and Road Initiative so they don't hyperinflate. And they're also uh, probably going to work on a, um, this is what BRICS wants. BRICS is essentially, uh, they, they came out with a report saying, or an announcement that they're looking into like a, a, a crypto uh, sort of money to uh, tr transmit, to just have like settlements, like a BRICS network. And they'll probably, like Russia, back their commodity, I mean, back their currency by a basket of commodities, like oil, gold, probably Bitcoin. I think we're foolish to assume that Russia is not mining Bitcoin. And if, if, if you have the marginal cost to uh, produce energy and like get oil, basically, if you are the cheapest place on earth to get oil, like why wouldn't you be mining Bitcoin right now? So, so China is basically like the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And that I think that is what explains the partnership between them and Russia. And, you know, Russia doesn't want to uh, like live under, you know, China's panopticon, whatever the hell they have going on over there. They are, Putin basically is a nationalist and he wants what's best for his, his, his country, his nation, for, for Mother Russia. And this is just kind of like the best thing to to do as part of with China and use their, their technology, especially I think uh, I need to look a little bit more into this, but when uh, when both Putin and uh, and Xi, when both China and Russia say that they wanna leave the World Trade Organization, that basically uh, lets them be able to not have to abide by intellectual property laws. And so I think one reason that China partnered with, or one reason Russia, chose partner with China is just because like, you know, they're a tech hub and they're on, on, uh, on, um, on top of that shit, but also they're, uh, they're, they're <laughs> as uh, echoes from the Trump administration, they steal intellectual property from America. And this is just like a, 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 a fracturing of a world order and you're gonna steal whatever technology you can to, to have a, a lasting nation and economy. So I think that has a lot to do with why Russia and uh, China partnered because they're not on the Davos train. And where did, it came up really early in the show. So where, did, where does COVID uh, fit in in the pandemic? Um, yeah, so like I said- I, it was I think, an attack on the Fed. Yeah, because, you know, past like the, the CARES Act, you know, all this, this COVID stimulus, that was one way to basically weekend the, the credibility of the United States, all this helicopter money. And also it was just a way to probably, you know, divide people more so than they already are. Because you have like, so maskers, you're non-maskers. Right. And, and funny, Russia was actually the first one to come up with like a vaccine, but it was basically minus all the mRNA stuff. And Russia tried to make nice with the World Economic Forum saying, hey, we have this thing, it works. And I think that was just like the first, one of, one of the first slaps on the wrist that Davos had against Russia because it wasn't basically the, the right formula that Bill Gates wanted. Right, so, okay, how does, so how does, if, it, if it's a, a Davos led attack on the Fed, how does Wuhan and China fit into this and China's reaction and China doing lockdowns? 
would they just kind of have, were they incentivized to also mutually attack the Fed or something at that time? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, until uh, December of the uh, Davos or virtual Davos meeting, I think that everybody was pretty much on the same team or China was still on team Davos until then. And again, it's all about China trying to have its empire, its nation. And, and, and this is what, uh, what I think kind of led to this bond between Russia and China because they've been, their empires have been around much longer than Europe for centuries. And the way that they think and their methodology is much more uh, meticulous and focused and more low time preference. And so I think that was one of the main things that uh, I, they ideologically had a disagreement between you know, Russia, China versus, uh, versus Europe. If that answers your question a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so then where does Trump, Biden, Hillary, Putin fit into all of this? Trump, Biden, Biden uh, Hillary, and Hillary, Putin. Biden, I mean, Putin. Uh, I know it's a lot there, but like, so is Trump somehow aligned with Powell? Is Trump aligned with Putin? No, um, uh, like, I, I'm just spitballing here, right? Yeah, no, I know. And, so, and- so yeah, I mean, let, let's work this out here. So I think Trump was kind of a blessing in disguise because he further revealed, and again, I don't, of domestic politics as much as I should as an American. But I think that Putin, I um, mean, not Putin, I think Trump lifted the veil of the deep state and how, you know, the Russia hoax was nothing but a hoax. And he was further, he further kind of like, you know, poked us all with a proverbial stick uh, to, to, just like separate people, like lift the veil from their eyes to, to see that, you know, a lot of people are divided and people are going against the, the mainstream media cathedral and that what we're being told is a lie if the Democrats are working this hard to be anti-Trump because they didn't get Hillary and like the promise of jobs. And I'm mean, Hillary's a globalist. So she's team Davos, Biden's team Davos, Obama's team Davos. Trump, as far as Putin, I mean, I have heard Trump say that in, in, in interviews I've heard of people talking about the matter that uh, Trump had kind of high praise of uh, dealing and negotiating with Putin and just how reasonable he is. And, and honestly, Trump was just kind of a deal maker. And when you come, when you want to bring up like Trump and Powell, I mean, if you remember, Trump was like, no, Jerome Powell, you're going to keep rates low. And I think that was just a political move because people want like fun, easy money, good times. And when when uh, that's when that's in the zeitgeist of the American economy, they point and thank the president for happy times. So Trump just wanted to be reelected. So I kind of tried to mish, mash all that into one pot. But again, I'm kind of an ignoramus when it comes to <laughs> domestic politics. So that's on my bucket list. But at the end of the day, it's just kind of like a vague idea of who these people are, what side they're on. Are there any like infighting between uh, whatever faction they come from? But what do they represent and who benefits from what policy and why are they for that policy? Like what, it's just, what is their incentive? All the money. Yeah. Do you think Davos wants the Republicans? And I hate getting into Republican Democrat stuff, but even though maybe, no, no, as you, you said, can't. We and I, I just need to like bring this up. Like you, you cannot talk about macro economics, money without politics. There's so many people when I go in to finance spaces, even Bitcoin spaces, they're like, "Oh, Bitcoin is it political? Oh, well, I don't want to get into politics. That's bullshit." Well, life is political. Yes, thank you. I mean, like the infighting of like the the carnivore plebs versus the vegan plebs, or like whatever. I want big families. I don't want big families. Sit up. Like that's politics. Like all politics is is like the relationship between friend and foe. 
Yeah, but, uh, I think there's sort of, well, I think one of the notions that Bitcoiners are getting at is, I don't know if I want to wait around four years and, and spend four years uh, hoping and wishing and campaigning and thinking one vote is going to change everything. Uh, you know, and then maybe it'd be great if politics were a little bit more closer to home or that local, uh, well, who votes local person, power bases had more power over my, not power. Who, who my life more. said who votes the president into office? Your local representative. And when you vote Republican, your life is just better. <laughs> like, like the, the only so, shitty thing about Republicans really is foreign policy. And like uh, our allies with Saudi Arabia and Israel, which that's well, one, starting, one of my issues, that's starting to break down. One of my issues there is, you know, uh, I, I, I try to stay independent of the mind in the sense that I might agree with one party more than the other. In fact, I could, uh, I don't think this is the case, but I could agree with one party 99 times out of 100, but I'm not going to go with that party on the one out of 100 I don't agree. And, and I want to look at it more on an issue-based thing uh as you should as you should but just like checking the scorecard and i think things are definitely changing and foreign policy stuff aside i think and like i agree with uh tom longo and others in the sphere that say we could look at a desantis gabbard ticket in 2024 you see and think of that i mean fundamentally as we understand what politics are left versus right i think that's starting to break down and we just become like more of a nationalist populist, what's good for America and ultimately what's good for the states. Because why do you think people are leaving California to Texas and Florida? Because they vote red and red like just has a better track record of not fucking over their people. Yes. Maybe, maybe they get too much money from Israel or the military industrial complex. Either way, whatever. But people care about their school district. And they care about their local taxes and their property taxes. And, and when you act locally, but think globally, you're just better off. Because that's what you can do. That's, that's how you accomplish shit, is you run locally. And ultimately, this is what the Citadel becomes. It's this Hans Hermann Hoppe idea of secession. I would love to see 50 countries instead of 50 states in America. And I think this is the step forward. And I think Bitcoin is the only missing piece of sound money. But essentially, vo voting locally helps. And it's just only uh, by default that your local representative that you voted for to unfuck your life because you had these crazy leftist policies ruin your child's childhood because they have tranny bathrooms and they're forcing your, your kid to call someone a girl when they're really a boy and they're on 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 hormones at age 12 i mean that's just another davos tactic of degrading the cultural morality and so it's only by default that you know you vote for your re republican representative that they go and vote whoever has the republican ticket for president like sure it's not perfect and democracy is a shit coin as well but like if you want to be a part of the conversation you have to realize like work with what we're dealt with and instead of bitching and hoping that bitcoin's going to fix everything great but i live right now so and look i um i don't vote often but um I don't know. At the end of the day, if you're not going to participate, at least, you know, be a part of the conversation is what I'm saying. I love being a part of the conversation. Uh, I, I, I kind of hope to never vote again in national elections. I, I, I still debate that. I, I have exercised my right to vote <clears throat> in my adulthood. Uh, I, as someone who just moved to Florida, uh, and as someone who doesn't revere or look up to politicians, I, I hope DeSantis doesn't run uh, for president. Uh, his policies, and not every single one of them, are a big reason I, I did move to Florida, amongst many others, like my my parents and the weather and whatnot. Yeah. But um, and I, I look at national politics. 
uh, emotionally, I've seen it. I think psychologically, I think a lot of it's been used as a pendulum to kind of destroy totally agree. proletariat. Totally agree. And I think part of the swinging back and forth between parties is is not just is, is to keep us fighting over a lot of yeah. the, these issues you brought up that Davos is bringing to the country. A, I think it's a shame we have national conversations around anything, much less a lot of the topics we've been talking about. Uh, and I think those are meant to divide. But but what I mean is uh, I kind of see it as like the Harlem Globetrotters or the WWE, I think it's called now, but when I was kids, WWF. So, you know, you, you might root for Hulk Hogan and you want him to beat up uh, Randy Macho Man Savage, but uh, the owner of the league gets paid no matter who wins. And those two guys go out to dinner together and maybe vacation together and are best friends. And yeah. there's no real fight. And, and the way I see that would sort of like, over I think the last... that's, that's changed. Like, like the, the whole Davos element, I think that is significant. Maybe. What, what I see though is um, at, at one level from 50,000 feet, 100,000 feet is, you know, uh, maybe the Republicans win and we get tax breaks for the rich. And then the Democrats win and we get tax hikes on the poor and middle class. Sure. And that's kind of like a big win-win for the, mostly the, the, the centralized power structure. Yeah. Um, you know, individuals can win out in that and it can help business and different effects on the economy and things like that. But with all that being said, do you think Davos wants the Republicans to take over in 2022 and 2024? Oh, yeah, definitely. So, like, this goes back to, like, the, the neocon right faction of, like, your Pompeos and just warmongers. And that's a problem. And, um, yeah, I mean, the pendulum's going to swing and it's going to suck. And ultimately, uh, you can maybe throw me in that, like, Bitcoin fixes this category now. But I think, like, that, like, if a Gabbard DeSantis ticket happens... Or whatever happens next. Like, we're probably going to see a red wave come the midterms. But all of the, this whole pendulum swing, I think, ultimately is going to be a win, not just for the country, but like for the individual states themselves as well. I don't really know how this plays out. Again, I should probably look further into domestic politics. But, um, but yeah, I, I don't. Uh, I, I just hope for a secession sooner than later, but um, how that mm -hmm. process looks, I want that to go as smooth as possible. Uh, well, the Civil War kind of showed us that uh, it's kind of precedent for maybe the national government not really allowing secession. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think that happens until... Uh, I, I do like the idea of 50 strong decentralized states with a, a, a national alliance around border defense. Uh, and property rights. Yeah. I think it would be great if a federal government really just focused on those two things. Um, what what I found really interesting about this SDR piece is this kind of linked together how the SD because I, I never really understood what the end game was for SDRs, but I think you kind of laid it out where they want that to become the global world reserve currency. Yeah. And, and they're kind of uh, normalizing the IMF using that as a currency to, to bail out other economies or nations, uh, sort of use it as monetary colonialism. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I never really saw that. I thought that was really fascinating. And I didn't recognize how that pit them against the Fed, obviously. Um, so I, I thought that was really interesting in the work. Um, yeah. Oh, no, I, I disagree. But yes, the Fed is off the reservation. And uh, that I kind of find really interesting, like, th that particular phrase, because I just, I didn't see this rebellious nature to the Fed. Um, and, and it's kind of interesting to hear that, you know, the, in your perspective, they've kind of gone rogue there. The other thing I wanted to note in terms of sort of left-right dynamics, uh, and I kind of picked this up from Texas Slim when he was on my show, but I agree with him when he said, you know, I think, do-goodism is, is modern-day feudalism. Um, so, yes. uh, you know, because I, I think that when we get into these left-right debates, I think there's way more consensus and agreement in the middle than 
either side wants to acknowledge or or reckon with um, because of emotions. I, I think that when you really boil it down, left, right, whatever it might be, everyone wants usually a better future for the next generation. They want the same things. They just disagree on how they get there. Right. And, but I think that in this sort of um, this Davos paradigm, when you look at something like Operation Paperclip and the remnants of World War II and, you know, sort of this uh, what you, you've been hinting at is sort of this ideology, this communist socialist ideology coming out of Europe that frankly hasn't died. It is it's very strange that the U.S. allowed Germany to rebuild so quickly and so strong. And, you know, it, it seems like a lot of this ideology has, has not gone away just because a war was fought and lost. Um, so I, I think in that regards, I think there's a lot of people who are attempting to do good at, at their own expense or against their own self-interest. And, but they think, think it's for a greater good uh, and i think that's being used against i mean that's that that's that like case. the that's the people in like the lemmings as alex fesky would call mm -hmm. them and the just the order takers and paper pushers but not Klaus schwab and certainly not the people that run Klaus Schwab. well i think he's running those operations i think he's sort yeah. of like injecting society with that modern day do-goodism yeah. to kind of yeah, be a he's form of feudalism it, he's selling it to npcs <clears throat> well, it is what does NPC stand for? Non-player character. Is that a video game term? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just, just like normies. Like, anyone that actually thinks that green renewable energy is going to work is just a, a normie that hasn't thought everything through and is probably, like, low IQ. And they they take they're, they get taken advantage of because they're lemmings and they're so dependent on the state and they look to daddy government and they don't have an independent thoughts. Right. So what do you think the end goal is for Davos? Let's say they're successful and they destroy the credibility of the U.S., uh, I mean, the Federal Reserve, and uh, as the U.S. as a place to store your, your, your wealth, your capital, your value, buy yeah. securities, whatever it might be, invest in companies, entrepreneurs, um, they kind of fend China off, even if China sort of has its sphere. Um, they're able to maybe tame Russia and still extract resources from Russia at a reasonable price. What is Davos's end game? What's their goals? Yeah, their end game is to, you know, be more successful than America by destroying America and implement the Great Reset, where you owe nothing to be happy and arguably probably depopulate a good majority of the world. I'm not arguing that's, you're going to get like the like, read more about COVID-19 thing over this episode, but that's essentially what the vaccine was, right? Just poison, arguably. And, um, you know, depopulate. It's, it's a very eugenic, eugenicist-based ideology. But not only that, it's just a, uh, they, they want to, I think, disband NATO and um, just how the war in Ukraine, I, I think, is going and just foreign policy in general. Um, I think Europe wants to leave NATO so mm. they don't have to fight against the, uh, the, the dissenting opinions of the neocon like Anglosphere types. And they want to have their own foreign policy because... Uh, NATO foreign policy is basically driven by, again, like those Mike Pompeo neocon sort of types. And so they no longer want to be reliant on a, Europe, a uh, American military. They want to destroy America, have all of the manufacturing and stuff uh, come out of Europe. And they basically just want to like have their own weird Great Reset empire. Yeah. So these, think of like Panopticon worse than China. Right. So in that regard, like not really merging with China, but just exporting its yeah. social credit score system. You don't have to merge Ex with them. You could just, I, I think, or import it, I should say. No, no, no. Not export, but exploit. Exploit and then export. 
Yeah. Um, very fascinating there. Uh, so what do you make of China and the hash rate and, you know, them sort of, as we mentioned, I mean, I think that Russia is mining Bitcoin. I think any country sort of with free to marginal cost, why would, even if they're mining it to just sell it, you know, yeah. uh, but um, where do you think China and Bitcoin? Um, uh, well, the majority of hash rate is in the United States now. And well, so left China, right? I mean, they kicked it out, it seemed like. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I can't remember where I heard it, but I think more miners are coming back on from China. But regardless, the majority of the hash rate is in America now. And I think that sets the Fed up in a pristine position to embrace Bitcoin, build a new financial rails on top of it, as it's been hinted in papers and have a basket of commodities, whether it's treasuries, a uh, mix of Bitcoin and gold, and just kind of like start anew on this weird quasi sound money rational economy. And I know that that sounds blasphemous to Bitcoiners that might be listening to this because, oh no, American government bad. Like I, I honestly think that you're seeing a a, a change in mindset from Powell and people like him. I think that he's wanted to revert this ever since 2018. And he's able to do that and raise rates now because of the position he's in and the financial tools that he has. Yeah. Uh, you, it's in, earlier you mentioned sort of Bitcoiners trying not to be political. And I, I, I do get what you're saying. I think there's this, Again, just to elaborate a bit of it on it or expand, I, I think there's this notion of like, I don't want to have to worry about what individual <clears throat> men or women or institutions think or, you know, more so in the long term. Just so I can stay the course and regardless of what happens, I, I can have this plan and I don't have to spend, I, I, and I could do more to spend my time and energy trying to be productive for myself and my family and not have my energy consumed by this stuff. It'd be better if, if the money was separated from the state. Yeah. Um, but that's not reality. It's not the world we live in. Um, so uh, in terms of, uh, do you think it's possible then that maybe the NSA or one of these three letter agencies American invented, discovered Bitcoin. Uh, and Powell is either knows or doesn't know, but like it's it, it's part of some greater plan. No, no. Uh, I haven't like gotten that into it, but it, like regardless of who invented it, it's like it's irrelevant and it's out of their hands because Bitcoin's unstoppable and unfuckable with. I think as far as Powell goes during Trump's administration, I forget who, uh, but some congresswoman, I think, proposed an idea of backing the treasuries with a, uh, a certain amount of gold as well. And I think Bitcoin is just an excellent pairing there. Uh, gold is well, going to be a very big deal uh, in, during this transition because it, it's got like 5,000 years plus of Lindy. And central banks have been, you know, stockpiling this stuff up too. So, but I think as far as like interminglings of like PAL and other agencies and Bitcoin, I think that's just as far as it goes. Well, I mean, we, I mean, this is fantastical, but, you know, uh, Satoshi allegedly mined a million or so coins that have never moved. I always wonder maybe there were more coins under a different you know, uh, IP address or wallets, whatever that also could have been mined by Satoshi. But wouldn't it be uh, in terms of this, you know, Fed maybe using Bitcoin as a part of its basket of goods or being Powell making sort of Trojan horsing Bitcoin? Uh, what if the Federal Reserve announced tomorrow that uh, we own a million coins? That's why they haven't moved. Um, they're ours, and uh, we mined them at basically no cost in the first year or two of Bitcoin. And uh, we're, we're, we have Satoshi's coins. I mean, hey, that, would, that, that would put America and the Federal Reserve 
at the forefront of the next 500 years of the global reserve system. And I know that's a fantasy, but that, I mean, that would be one I mean, way. I mean, we would all be a golden wrong. way out. Yeah. As, since 2008, then we would have all been wrong about the federal reserve. Right. Or at least like their ideals or motives or whatever. I think that's way too fantastical. Would that be great? Like, yeah. Uh, people might actually feel more nationalistic and not hate their government as much. Um, I think, but yeah, that, that'd be a crazy thing. I highly doubt that's that's the case. But hey. Uh, you would think somewhere along the line. I mean, you know, we I mean there were free faucets for a while where you could just go enter your email address and get free Bitcoin. You'd hope they had scooped up some. If you take any of this sort of like. Well, we know we know money. that we know the government has a bunch of Bitcoin, right? Right. From uh, like Ross Ulbricht's. I don't know how much they can. And they were like, what other, whatever other cases. Don't they usually auction off most of it though? I know they have auctioned it off, but. Um, and we also I mean, don't know what companies they may or may not own directly or indirectly. Or, that's what I, yeah. You know, like like um, if a Coinbase or someone got nationalized, that would Sure, and they could me. seize and yeah. that could be a version of a 6102. Uh, do you think that uh, a transition to a Bitcoin standard has to be violent or, you know, necessarily a, a, have a violent collapse or transition? I hope not. I mean, what has to happen has to happen. Uh, but I, I, I certainly hope not. And I think that, you know, Powell kind of slow rolling what he's doing. And as everything e economically around the world starts to deteriorate, it's just like this slow kind of like transition thing and teasing Bitcoin ideas. Uh, I, th I think that we are going about it the right way, right? I, I mean, who am I to say, like, this is how we hyper-Bitcoinize? I'm not. But I do know for sure it needs to be gradual. I think a lot of people would would uh, agree with this, especially more tech-minded people. More things just need to be built out, just like today, the uh, announcement of uh, Fetty Mints and whatnot. Um, I mean, we need more, you know, more work needs to be done. We're in the bear market, right? And we're building in the bear market. And I think the Fed's building in the bear market as well. But not everybody's going to be able to own their UTXO in the world. So there's going to be custodial solutions and markets are built on trust. And I think that's the best manifestation of true free market economics. When you have institutions boom and bust and whatever survives is survival of the fittest and they'll other companies will adopt the model that best works for people and their customers. And that slow transition, that process, that evolution needs to happen. And we need to maintain gradually and then suddenly. Where do you think, you said corporations or companies that you said, but where do you think then Silicon Valley sits in all of this? Um, oh, I, I look at Davos Twitter. Zone. What? They're, they're both like Davos. Andreessen and Horowitz, all these shitcoin things, Ponzi-nomics, the, um, I mean, they're probably Davos, but I mean, even, like, Bitcoin's for everyone, right? So if Davos people are owning Bitcoin, mm -hmm, they, mm -hmm. I think that this whole contagion, Ponzi-nomics, the, the suing and fall of Celsius and, and all these other things, like BlockFi, Sam Bankman free coming in, JP Morgan in his way, I think all of that was an attack on the industry and to suppress the price of Bitcoin to buy more Bitcoin. I agree. I agree 100%. I think all of crypto is a state-sponsored vector attacked on, on Bitcoin. I think from, you know, uh, allowing scams and blow-ups to hurt, yeah. you know, I mean, not all of it. It's like you have, you have basement nerds that are sure, you know, no, I'm organically come statement. up. But, but they, I think the, the fact thing. they allow these things uh, with yeah, obvious securities uh, for people to get hurt with, with known sort of yeah. predatory regulators finance. see an opportunity that's ripe to take advantage of because they're just opportunistic and they astroturf these companies or they they give the owners of these companies because that's what shit coins are, they're companies. Yep. Uh, shout out to Base, that's his thing. Um, but these cryptos are companies 
and these C CEOs get offers they can't refuse. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I think it was I was in a spaces uh, with Tone Bays and I forget it was someone else, but I think he was building on Tone's point, but mentioned how I mean, it, oh, it, it might have been Dennis Porter, but uh, how long term, you know, even if some of these shit coins end up sticking around or whatever, but even something like Ethereum could will probably, if not become a company like a legit company, legit not being the right word, but like <laughs> register as a company. Uh, but even if it doesn't, would probably market itself and li even list itself on like NASDAQ as a security, even if it never becomes uh, a registered yeah. company. And yeah. then just will even have some sort of, you know, more of a corporate type, you know, social and marketing and legal and investor relations type profile. Um, and, and they are all securities, whether they're registered or legal or not, uh, in my opinion. Or I mean, not every, I can't speak for every single one of them. Um, and I think it's a form of gambling. Um, and I think that's just because of the monetization of everything and people are looking for alpha anywhere they can. And they're sort of hopeless around, you know, what's going on in society. But, uh, uh, Phil, we've covered everything. I, I think I set out to cover here tonight. Um, I, I, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this. It is really, it was one of the most eye opening kind of threads and connecting the dots of I've come across in a while. So uh, thank you so much, bro. I'll leave it to you for any parting words and to let people know where they can find you and your work. Yeah. So thanks again for having me. It's, it's a, it's a beefy subject in a lot of different angles. Uh, and I have learned so much. And since I wrote that, that piece, but really before I started writing it, uh, when I heard Tom Longo on a podcast in October, and then I later became a, a patron and, um, you know, this isn't like a shill for, for him and his service and stuff, but just remember to be open-minded and of other opinions and Hey, I could be completely wrong. Okay. But like, if I am, I'll be the first to admit it, but I have learned a shit ton along, along the way. So if you have any questions, you can shoot me a DM. I'm Mr. Sue on Twitter, M-R-P-S-E-U. Uh, or just type in a Phil Gibson. Uh, Powell is my pal. And I, I will happily tweet at you or DM you uh, paragraph lengths of explanations or whatever it takes. I'll send you links. Um, there's some stuff we didn't get into, the sofa versus LIBOR thing. Uh, but we can maybe say that for another episode or you can just... Uh, you know, DM me and yeah, uh, hold on to your butts. I, I, I want to say, don't get discouraged from any doom porn scrolling. I'm really optimistic about the country, America, but also like the world and where things are going. Things might get ugly, but this is what needs to happen. We're going through an evolution, a world evolution. And thank God we have Bitcoin at the end of it. So um, yeah, that, that's those are my uh, my thoughts, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you, my friend. It's been so dope. Awesome.